Hello, my name is Satish Putan Parel. Welcome to my lectures on Introduction to Galva Theory. Introduction to Galva Theory. With these lectures, I'm planning to discuss the syllabus of the Algebra 2 papers, the Algebra 2 paper on the second semester of MSc students of uh, Calicut and Kannur universities. The book I'm going to use for this course is uh, a first course in abstract algebra by J.B. Fadi. Just to want to talk about the prerequisites for this course. Um, I would like you to know the basic group theory. and the ring theory and field theory. That you already studied in your first semester algebra first paper. Basically what I'm looking for is the definition of groups, rings and fields. then subgroups, subrings, and subfields, then group and ring homomorphism, then normal subgroups then integral domain these are all uh, topics which you already studied in your first semester algebra course so I'm sure that you are familiar with these topics. But in case if you are not, this book gives you a very good introduction to any of these topics. So if you are not familiar with these topics, please go through this book before we continue this course. I'm assuming that you already know all these topics and with that I'm going to start the introduction to Galva theory. So the first chapter which you are going to discuss for this course is uh, Supreme and Maximal Ideals. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the definition of ideals. We have studied the same structure, the same kind of structure in group theory. So let me start with the group theory similar structure and come back to the uh, ideals. Ideal is a structure in ring. So in group theory, in group theory, let us assume that there is a group G with a binary operation plus see group and 
And let's take a subgroup of G. B a subgroup. So we can think about the left and right cosets of the subgroups. Let's take the right cosets. So H plus A, A in G, B the collection of right cosets. This is a collection of cosets in G. But we can make this collection a group, a different group by placing some additional condition on subgroup. If you take any subgroup, probably this may not be a group. But if you enforce some condition on the subgroup, we can make this as a group. So if H is a normal subgroup, then, then this collection with the following binary operation will become a group. The binary operation is like this, H plus A plus H plus B is equal to H plus a plus B. This two pluses within the parenthesis is the binary operation of G and the plus outside this parenthesis is the binary operation which we are defining on the collection of cosets. This is a valid binary operation on this collection of cosets if and only if H is a subgroup, normal subgroup, H is a normal subgroup. In that case, we will call this collection of cosets as a factor group and it's denoted by G over H or quotient group. So this is a quotient group H over G. So this structure we already know it's, it, this exists in group theory. We want to create the same structure in ring theory, in rings. The difference between groups and rings, the first difference is here we have only one binary operation. Here we will have two binary operations. So when you create a factor ring, you need two operations in the corsets. Here you have only one operation. So let us assume G is a group here, so it will be it will be, let's take R, B, A, B. Then, instead of a subgroup, we will take a, we'll take a subring. So let uh, M, R, B, a subring. And we create the same kind of cosets here, the right cosets or left cosets. So we'll take N plus A, A belongs to R. We are taking the cosets on the addition. R is a ring. So with the addition, R is an abelian group. So N is a normal subgroup of R, automatic, because R is a ring. So this is automatically a, it's automatically a, a group 
a factor group r by n but we are we want a we want to have a factor ring so with n being the normal subgroup of r n plus a plus n plus b is equal to n plus a plus b is already given it's already there we don't need an additional condition on r for this to be true but our aim is to make this as a ring some kind of ring just like we made this as a, a group we want to make so we want to we want to um, define a multiplication on this the multiplication of such collection of cosets is going to be like this n plus a times n plus b is equal to n plus a b but this is not going to be true for any subring this is going to be true only for a certain type of subring so we want to enforce some additional condition on this ring in order for this binary operation to be a valid one so if that condition if you enforce on subring then this subring will become an ideal so the the condition on n for the multiplication on the cosets of n is valid if put that condition on n then n will become the ideal so what is that condition that we are going to put that's what we have that's what we are going to see so we have a ring r and a subring n of r and we have a collection of cosets of this subring then we we have a addition of addition on this collection and we also define the multiplication on a our objective is to find out the additional condition on n such that the second multiplication operation is a valid one we know that this is always true if n is a subgroup so what is the condition which you want to put it on n so that this is a valid it's a valid uh, binary operation so what we will do is we'll take two elements from here let n1 comma n2 belong to n then we'll expand this like take an element from here say take an element from here take an element from here and multiply so it will be n1 plus a times n2 plus b we can expand this even if it is not a, a commutative ring so it will be n1 m2 plus n1b plus 
a m2 plus a b so when you multiply an element from here and element from here sorry ah yeah a representative from here and a representative from here you want to get n plus a b so a b is already here so what we want is the rest of the three elements the sum it should belong to n if this belongs to n then we are done that is what we want so so how do you make this to be an element of n this n1 times n2 is already in n so we don't need to consider this this is automatically in n so these two elements have to be in n so this has to be in n and this also has to be in n if this condition is true then this multiplication is a valid multiplication so this n1 and n2 are any elements of n a and b are any elements of r so the condition what we are going to arrive at is for any a b in r if a n2 belongs to n and n one b belongs to n then the multiplication on the cosets is right instead of saying like this because n1 and n2 are arbitrary elements of n so we are going to write this as in a slightly different way like n is a subring of r so for any for any a b in r a n is a subset of n and n b is a subset of n same thing here it is the same thing then then we will call n is a so we will write the definition a subring n of r is an ideal if a n is a subset of n and n b is a subset of n for all a b in r the reason why we want to enforce this condition is because we want to define a multiplication on the collection of cosets that is why we are arriving at this um, condition on n and we call that special subring is a as an idea so we have uh, a subring n of r with an additional condition n is a subset of n and this is a subset of n then the multiplication on the cosets of n is valid 
So this is a sufficient condition for the multiplication to be valid on the subway. Now let us assume this is valid and see what happens to these two conditions. So let us assume, assume that n plus a times n plus b is equal to n plus a b for all a b in R. So what I'm going to do here is, this is any b a and b in R. So we are going to write it like this, n plus a, n plus 0 is equal to n plus a times 0. And what is this? This is actually n plus a times n is equal to, this is 0, so this is n. So if you take any element from here and any element from here, then this is this is satisfied. So what we are going to do is the element what I am going to take is here, this is 0 plus a times n belongs to n. I am taking two different elements. The first element here I am going to take is 0. Second element I am taking say any n. So this is actually going to be a n belongs to n. So this is any n and this is any a. So this implies a n is a subset of n. Similarly, n b is a subset of so if you assume that the multiplication is a valid multiplication then we are going to arrive at the condition on n that for any a and b a n is a subset of n and then b is a subset of n. so so we can we can we can write it like this for a subring n of r n plus a times n plus b is equal to n plus a b is valid if and only if n is an Now I will uh, write the formal definition of the factor rings. Um, let be a ring and n is an ideal. Then n plus a, a belongs to r, is a ring with the following binary operations. 1, n plus a plus n plus b is equal to n plus a plus b to n plus a times n plus b is equal to n plus a. This ring is called the factor ring or quotient ring.
denoted by R will end the session with a couple of examples. Example, we are going to take R is equal to Z, is equal to set of all integers. Then the ideal is of Z are of the form NZ. That is, for example, 3Z. 0, 3, 6, minus 3, etc. This is definitely satisfied the condition of ideal because if you multiply any any element here with any element of here then it's a subset of this let's say 6c is equal to 2 times 3z this is our a this is our n and that is a subset of similarly if you multiply it on the other side also it will be the same thing Another example I would want to take is um, let F be the collection of all functions from R to R. R is real. Real number. Then the subring satisfying f belongs to f such that f of a is equal to 0 for some fixed a in r. It's because if you multiply any element, let's say p of n is going to be you know, it's going to be P times F such that F and P belongs to F and F of A is equal to 0. So this definitely is a subset of and because P dot F vanishes at A and that is a condition for N. So this is a subset of so this is a an ideal. 